you have your Bibles, 2 Corinthians 13 is really want to just share just a few thoughts that God has been putting on my heart. Um, I wasn't even planning on speaking this week. We were going to do testimonies prayer time, but then about Thursday or so, God just started laying this passage into my heart, and I just wanted to share just a few thoughts from this passage. It's a passage that's familiar to you because we often quote it at the end of services on our benediction, um, and, but I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on it before. And so it's, some of your Bibles, it's verses 13. Some of your Bibles, it's, verses, it's verse 14. It basically says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This verse this week has just been ministering to me, and I just want to share just a few thoughts. I'll, I'll try not to be long. I'll try to get you out of here in time. There's an Eagles game today. That's very important. So we'll try to get out on time. But I just want you to notice two things. Number one, I want you to notice the source of the blessing. Often when we sing the doxology at the end of our service, we sing praise God to whom all blessings flow. But it ends with praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Every source of our blessing is from the triune God. The Trinity reveals how God perfectly works in harmony together. In everything that God does, we see the three persons, the Father, the Son, the Spirit working together in creation. The Father is the author of creation. The Son, John 1 says, is the Word by whom everything was created. And that Genesis says that the Spirit was hovering over the earth, over the waters of the earth. Every part of creation was a sovereign act of the triune God, and none of it was made without each other. They were working together. Think about your salvation. It begins with God the Father choosing us before we were even formed to be saved. And then the Son comes and bears our guilt and our shame and our sin and takes our place. And then at some point, when we were still sinners, the Holy Spirit begins to work in us and says, Hey, we are broken. We need Jesus. The triune God has played a part in our... Every, uh, the triune God, every part has played a part in us coming to know Jesus. Think about our prayer life. The Father receives our prayer. The Father answers our prayer. Talk about the Son. The Son is up in heaven interceding for us when we pray. When we are praying, the, Father, the Son is pleading to the Father for us. And then Romans says that when we don't know what to pray, the Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And here in this benediction in 2 Corinthians 13, which Paul writes, we see the three persons of the Trinity just as perfectly blessing us since it pleads the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, the communion or the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. The same three persons of the Godhead that was created all of us, that created everything that we see, the same three persons of the Godhead that brought us into a relationship with Jesus, the same three parts of the Godhead that allows us, that gives us access to the throne room of God. Now, in this verse says, I am the one who is blessing you. I am the one who is going to bless you. And as we look forward to 2019, what a great assurance, and what a great joy that should bring us. That the triune God is for us, not against us. That the Father, Son, and the Spirit together is working for us. That He is always with us. That He never leaves us the Father the Son and the Spirit are the source of every blessing that you and I have received. May we be careful that we not forget it. But here's where the passage really has been ministering to me this week. I want you to notice the substance of the blessing from the triune God. The substance, what does he bless us with? The first thing he says is, may the grace of our Lord Jesus. The grace 
of Jesus refers to a number of things. It refers to his mercy, refers to his active love. This Jesus completely forgives a woman, and her life is so radically changed that she would walk into a crowded house and pour oil onto the feet of Jesus and then wipe his feet with her own hair. This grace that promises a thief that's hanging alongside of him today, you will be with me in paradise. This is the grace of Jesus, and may his grace be with us in 2019. It also refers to the wonderful attractiveness of the character of Jesus, that he was free from any meanness, that he was free from any awkwardness, but he was always accessible, taking the initiative in going to people in receiving little children into his hands, entering into homes for meals, into homes of sinners and outcasts. There was a leper, the gospel says, who was exiled for years, and he encounters Jesus. And not only does Jesus speak to him, and not only does Jesus take time to him, but scripture says that Jesus laid his hands on him. Who A man who for years no one has touched, all of a sudden felt the warm Hands of Jesus on his body. This is the grace of our Lord Jesus, his winsome attractiveness. May the grace of Jesus be with us in 2019. It also refers to the strength of Jesus to totally change a young, brash man, a fisherman like Peter, a Pharisee like Nicodemus a murderer like Saul. It was his omnipotent grace that transformed these men. May the grace of Jesus transform us in 2019. It doesn't say it's the justice of Jesus because that's getting what we deserve. It doesn't say the mercy of Jesus because that's not getting what we deserve. It says the grace of Jesus, which means we get what we don't deserve. We get what we don't deserve. It is the grace of Jesus, which is getting what you don't deserve. It is the grace of Jesus that opened our heart, that enabled us to believe, that joined us to himself. It is the grace of Jesus that declared you and I righteous before God. It is grace that adopted us into the family of God and made us joint heirs with him in righteousness. It is the grace of God that has kept us safe this far in the journey. And friends, it is the grace of God that's going to keep us into 2019. The grace of God. It is the grace of God, the Son, who is also the God-man, the God who is touched by the feelings of our sicknesses, that sympathizes with our griefs. It is omnipotent grace. It is omnipresent grace. It is omniscient grace. It is infinite grace. It is eternal grace. It is unchangeable grace. This grace can uphold you. This grace can strengthen you. This grace can comfort you. This grace can keep you. And this grace can make you triumph no matter what trial and temptation comes to you in 2019. It is the grace of Jesus. This is the grace of Jesus that keeps you from falling. This is the grace of Jesus that keeps you, that's able to present you faultless before God. It is the grace of Jesus that will give you exceeding joy in life. Whatever is good, the grace of God can supply. Whatever is bad, the grace of Jesus can withhold or prevent. Whatever you desire, his grace can provide. Friends, it is sufficient grace. It is abundant grace. It is inexhaustible grace. And friends, it's an insult for you and I to come and imagine that there is anything in our life that can keep us from the grace that cannot keep you. Can you imagine Jesus looking at Peter when he was sinking in the ocean and saying, you know what, I've given you one too many chances, I'm just going to let you drown. Can you imagine Jesus as a dying thief pleads for his life, Jesus says, you know what, You've sinned too much. I'm not going to let you in. Can you imagine blind Bartimaeus as he cries out to Jesus and says, Jesus, Jesus. Can you imagine Jesus just ignoring him and walking away and not paying attention to him? This grace that we have received from Jesus is vast. It's unmeasured. It's boundless. It's free, just like the ocean. 
Picture yourself at the ocean with a bucket and a shovel in your hand, and you take the shovel and you take a little bit of sand and you put it into the bucket, and then you take a little bit of water and you put it into the bucket, and you take a little bit of more sand and you put it into the bucket, and then all of a sudden you begin to freak out and say, oh my gosh, the ocean's going to run out. That's silly. And yet that is what grace is. His grace is abundant more and more to us. The immeasurable, immense grace of God is more than sufficient for insignificant beings just like us. The grace of Jesus keeps coming and coming and coming. He gives and he gives and he gives. And all we have to do is nothing but take and take and take. And even as we take, he gives more. And he says, just take it. Just enjoy it. The risen Christ met with the disciples right after he was resurrected. They had all forsaken him. They had all fled from him. They had all denied him. Thomas doubted him. But what did Jesus say to them when he met him? Did he scold them? Did he say to them, hey, you'll never find me trusting you again. You've got to earn your trust now. No. But he sent Mary with a message to his brothers. He's not ashamed of the weaklings of his brothers, to those men who had seen his miracles, to those men who had heard his teachings, to those men who had seen his life, and then they completely abandoned him. To them, Jesus said, listen, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I will trust my message to you, sinners. Here is the grace of Jesus. Not only does he forgive us, but in 2019, he gives each of us a work to do so that we would bring glory, honor to him. It is by the grace of Jesus. Friends, it is the grace of Jesus that protects us day by day. How vast is that protection? The gospel says that a hair of our head will fall without Jesus knowing it. This morning we were driving, some of you guys heard, we were trying to turn onto a major intersection, sitting in the middle of the road trying to turn, and a lady ignored the red light and missed us by that much. She was going 40 to 50 miles, and she screeched inches away from our lives. We would not be here today. What protected us? It is the grace of Jesus. In a microscopic world of cells of our bodies, the gracious Jesus is there constantly monitoring and scanning and destroying all that is life-threatening and preserving us day by day until his assignment for our lives is done. May the grace of Jesus be with you in 2019. How often have our possessions been kept by Jesus. I can't tell you the number of days I have left my house and left our garage open. And all of a sudden, my neighbors will text me and say, hey, your garage is open. And I'm not driving home just to close my garage, right? But I come home and not a thing has been taken. It is the grace of Jesus that doesn't just protect me, but protects what I own. The grace of Jesus has kept us this year. The grace of Jesus has watched over us this year. This is the protecting grace of Jesus. It is always active. How encouraging it is that as we think about our children going to school, and as we go to distant places for travel, and when we leave our homes in the morning for work, that we know that in every one of those places, the grace of Jesus has gone before us. May the grace of Jesus be with us in 2019. The second thing he says is, may the love of God be with you. May the love of God be with you. God is a God of love. What an amazing information to millions and millions of people in this world, but what amazing news to you and I that God is is a God of love. The Lord is righteous, the Lord is holy, the Lord is just, the Lord is true, but the Apostle Paul in this benediction doesn't hone in on any of those things, but he says, may the love of God be with you. Why does he place such preeminence on this characteristic of God? Because the moment we say that God is love, we're saying that he's not just an abstract being because abstract beings cannot love 
But when we talk about the love of God, we're saying that God has a mind, a conscience, a heart. He's not simply a principle or a law. God is a person with a thought and a will, not a conditioned reaction. He can embrace and he can give himself to other people. He is a God with a heart. That is the great thing that that is the great thing that Paul says about God the Father that he is a love to a person whom he never to a person that who does not relate to him he says I will be your father. He's not simply an influence or he's not simply a force or a power like nuclear fusion or electricity. These are unaffectionate unaffect, unaffectionate beings. They have no love. But God is different in his being because he made us and fundamentally he has a heart and life and personality that extends himself to love the people that he has made in his own image. Paul singles out the love of God because this is the innermost nature of God. This is what the Lord is. This is his essence, his being. This is the core of God. Right in the depths of all that he is, he is love. He extends himself in blessing and kindness and good will to all that he has made. Think about the implications of the incarnation. God is the one who determined to take on form of a servant. And in the very depths of his heart, looks not for his own things, but he looks out for you. And for me, this is love. God is love in all that he does. His love is never contradicted. There's no dark background in God. He has no past. He's not recovering from anything. There are no depths in God that are contradictions of his love. Love is what he is to the depths of his being. Love is what he is through and through. Love is what he has always been. Love is what he is today. And love is what he will be in 2019. He never grows cold. His love never fades. It never wanes. Love is what he is consistently. And Paul wants to impress on our hearts, upon the Corinthian church and upon our hearts, that God is love and may his love be with us into 2019. Paul singles out his love for this reason, that for us in our condition, the greatest possible thing that we need from God is to know that he loves us. What are we as men and women? What are we as humanity? We stand in our frailty, in other insignificance as mortal beings. How quickly the waters close around us. Life goes on and soon we will be forgotten. We are tiny specks in a small planet, in a little galaxy, in an immeasurable universe. And yet God says, I love you. What tremendous comfort as we face for ourselves the trials and tragedies that life may bring to know that we're not simply creatures on a tiny planet in an insignificant galaxy, the product of a chance evolutionary survival of the fittest of beings over billions of years, but rather you and I stand here this morning immeasurably loved by the almighty God and king of the universe. This God who created the universe loves you. He has a heart, and he is in love with the world. And Scripture says he gave himself for you. The great mathematician, this incomparable physicist, this tremendous engineer, this thinker with his creativity and instinct, he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. That transforms every agony we meet. It comforts every sorrow we face. That such a God exists with such a profound commitment to you and I. He came from heaven to be where we were. We are not insignificant beings. We are not lonely beings trapped as in an impersonal cosmos. We are not buried in the darkness of the universe. Our lives have been caught up in the generous and loving purposes of Almighty God. God loved us and sent his son to be the substitute for our sins. 
There is something in the very nature and being of the only true living God that requires a sacrifice, atonement for forgiveness. And with that in light, we illuminate the darkness of the event of the crucifixion of Jesus. Think about it. On the darkest day of humanity is the place where we meet God's love in full force. Calvary is a tremendous achievement of an accomplished redemption. It is the conquest of the powers of evil. The cross did something of significant glory, but more than that, the cross says something. A voice from Calvary cries out that says God is love, that he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish. It's said not vaguely, but so precisely that the creator is love and that the death of his son has reconciled you and I to him. And now God makes that extravagant love available to each of us. Listen, as followers of Jesus, none of us have the right to conclude that we have behaved so badly, that we have sinned so much, that we are outside of the love of God. Sinner, the love of God will not let you go. The love of God will not let you go. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son? He leaves the father, abandons everything. What brought him back to the father? What jolted him out of his despair and got him home? It wasn't an awareness of what the wickedness that he had done. It was a glimpse of the Father's love. If I return, he's not going to reject me. If I come back, he will at least welcome me back as a servant. He may have been a servant back at home, but he knew the Father would not turn his back on him. There is nowhere else in the world I can go but to my Father's house. And that persuasion brought him back to the Father's house. And the Father didn't treat him as a servant, but welcomed him and loved him and embraced him. And called him son. Friends, you and I, we know the boundaries of love. We know what it's like to set limits. We say, this is all we can handle, this is all we can do. But God knows no limits. He gave himself. To the point of death, he gave himself. The Son gave himself for the life of the world, and from that cross and there alone comes these words, I give you myself. I have been broken on the cross. I have been made sin in the place of darkness. I have become the righteousness of God, and now I have come to save you. God has met the cost for our fall. The wages of sin has been paid to the last penny. There is no debt outstanding. Love has taken the liability and bore the entire bill. Because of his love, Jesus has, shat has been shattered in my place. His life has been poured out. His heart has been broken. God says this is his love for the world, love that hones in on sinners like you and I, and he never lets us go. This this is the fundamental heartbeat of God. His love, is, it, this is his instinct, his essence, his form, his glory, his being, and his love is with us forevermore. May the love of God be with you in 2019. And he says one last thing. He says, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. May the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say, may the Holy Spirit be with you. Paul writes to the church in Rome, and he says the Holy Spirit has already been given to us. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. Paul doesn't say, may the power of the Holy Spirit be with you, or the anointing of the Holy Spirit be with you, or the gifts of the Holy Spirit be with you, or the blessing of the Holy Spirit be with you. He doesn't say that. And it's not wrong to desire or even covet any of those desires. The spirit we have, but the spirit we should keep on desiring. Paul says, keep being filled with the spirit. To the Corinthian church, it says, desire the gifts of the spirit. But Paul talks about, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Paul tells the Corinthians church that we are baptized by one spirit into one body. None of us are mere individual Christians. Friends, Christianity in isolation doesn't exist. When an individual joins an armed forces, he becomes part 
of the unit. When a a person joins a soccer team, he becomes part of a team. When you join a work company, you become part of the workforce. There is no place for free spirits where we can come and go whenever you want. And in the church, God puts every one of us into the local church body. We need each other. We need to care for each other. That's why Paul would write, if one part suffers, all of us suffers. If one part is honored, everyone rejoices. This is where we, as members of the body, are being challenged. May the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. So can I invite you to pray for ourselves this time? May the grace of Jesus be with us in 2019. May the love of God be with us in 2019. May we be in fellowship by the power of the Spirit and love and care for each other in 2019. May the blessing be known in our church to every member. May the whole professing church be stirred by grace and love and fellowship that comes only from the true and living God. Only then will this dying world be aroused to the sad reality of its despair and its need for Jesus. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us as we look forward to 2019.